God's power works best in our weakness. In effect, he manifests his power through our weakness. See, in this passage, Paul is saying something incredible happens in the midst of our struggles. We discover the power of Christ is at work. Forgiveness does not turn us into doormats. In fact, the opposite occurs when we forgive because we then truly become victorious. When we forgive an offense, we set a prisoner free, only to discover that really we were the prisoner. God's inviting us into a new reality. Forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling, and it must be a daily choice. We would like to wait until we feel, felt like forgiving and then let our choices follow. But if we did it this way, we would always live according to the reality of this world. However, if we dare to believe God and choose first, our feelings will follow our decision. We then shift from merely responding to what happens to us to choosing to live in the tree of life. Remember, choices lead, feelings follow. The forgiven. Why is it so vital that we forgive? Because we, the forgiven forgive. Isaiah 1, 18-19 says, Your sins were scarlet, and Jesus has made them white as snow. They were crimson, and he has made them as wool. Notice at the end of the scripture, it says, If you obey me. Forgiveness is not a suggestion, but a requirement from our Father for us and for our benefit. Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32 tells us, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. The first step that God takes in our relationship with him is he forgives us. Romans 5 and 8 says that while we were still yet sinners, God sent Jesus to die for us. He made the first move by choosing to forgive us before we asked. We must make the same decision in every relationship. This is critical to understand. It is impossible to forgive others of their offenses until we receive forgiveness for ourselves. If we struggle with forgiveness, chances are we have not fully grasped what he has done for us. We've received total forgiveness for past, present, and future sin. It is not that God forgets our sins, but rather he chooses to remember our sins no more. He chooses to never bring up our sin again, ever. Why does he do this? Because God desperately wants to be in relationship with you. See, when we have difficulty forgiving others, it means we've not fully understood how large a debt that we had that God forgave us. Oh, I am running. I don't know what happened. Someone just said I'm running. Oh, I'm on. I have no idea what happened there. <laughs> Let me tell my son real quick. I have no way to let everyone know I'm on. I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't have time to try to go into my... Um, I don't have time to try to go into my um, email program to tell everybody. Um, I wish there was an easy way for everyone to know. So Sherry's on. God bless you. Thank you for jumping on. I hope I hope everybody comes back. Uh, I don't know what happened to the to the feed. It just um it messed up on me. So oh, I am running. I don't know what happened. So anyway, I can see now I'm running. That is so strange. <laughs> I hope the first half of my teachings there. So anyway, if you want to uh, catch up with me, I'm on page 70. Um, well, I wish I had a way to, to text everybody. Let me just do this. Forgive me. I, I need to let everyone know that I'm on. 
let me just go real quick and and just take a few type in a few names here there's andrew jackson let's see there's one let's see yeah it's gonna be too hard for me to try to Hopefully, everyone just has to come back and do the, um, the replay. Let me do sharp. Okay, that's all I can do for now. But praise God, I'm on. So I'm on page 70 right now. Uh, teaching on forgiveness, and I just uh, was talking about how um, uh, in, in a relationship with God, the first step he takes is he forgives us. And while we're yet sinners, um, that's when uh, Christ died for us. And, and the, the principle I was teaching here was that it's impossible to forgive others of their offenses until we receive forgiveness for ourselves. Let me pause here and try to explain this to you. You know, it's, it's you know, in, in my dealing as a leader with people, I've discovered that um, for some reason, um, people, if they do not think they're loved, then they're not loved. If they don't think God loves them, then in their paradigm of understanding, in their emotions, in their ability to receive love, they're not loved. And and if someone does not really believe that I love them, no matter what I do, what action I do, what I say, they cannot receive love from those actions because they don't believe that they're loved. In the same way, if, if you follow the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you think that somehow you've got to do something to make up for mistakes, for sins, you've got to punish yourself, you've got to pay a price, then the truth is you truly don't believe that when 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 Jesus said that by when I that I shed my blood for you for the forgiveness of your sins and when you confess and forsake your sin, I forgive you and I forget it and I move on. If somehow you still think that 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 you're not forgiven, then it's next to impossible for you to release and forgive others. So, um. You must first uh, ask God to give a revelation and ask God to help you to not struggle with forgiveness and grasping that truth. The truth is we've received total forgiveness for past, present, and future sin. It's not God that forgets our sins, but the Bible says Rather, he chooses to remember our sin no more. Isn't it amazing? God can choose to not remember. Why does he do this? Because God desperately wants to be in relationship with us. Now, in your homework, you should have written out Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Isaiah 43 and verse 25 says, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake, and I will never, never think on them again. That means if you've asked God to forgive you for something, brother, sister, your sins have been put as far as the east is from the west. And to drag something back up that happened 10 months ago, six months ago, a year ago, and say, God, I should have never done that. Please forgive me. I feel like somehow you're on uh, uh, the back shelf because God's going to make you pay. You're going to have to pay for what you did. That's not grace. In fact, that frustrates God's grace. Because when you bring it up, God's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I chose to never remember that thing you did again because you asked me to forgive you. I covered you with my blood. I washed you. You are cleansed. You are purified. You are justified by my blood. 
You should have also written out Hebrews 8 and 12. Hebrews 8 and 12 says, And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. <laughs> what a glorious thing. Thank you, Jesus. Just, it's, such a, it's such a freeing thing when you finally understand that once you, once you take those mistakes and failures, and there's not levels with God. God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to forgive you if you're lying, but if you commit fornication or commit adultery, well, then that's a different story. You're going to have to be put on a back burner. You're going to have to sit for six months, and you're going to have to suffer because of what you did. That's the words of the enemy. That's the words of religious order, legalism. That's exactly how the Pharisees and Sadducees were. That's the words from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life says you're free. You're free. He nailed your sins to the cross. And there it was purged forever. Amen. So let yourself off the hook. Quit allowing yourself to have a defeating mindset, a negative defeating concept of God that thinks somehow because somewhere you missed a turn. Somewhere you didn't quite measure up to the mark. You either didn't do what God asked you to do, or you disobeyed his word. That now God's punishing you. My friend, God wants you to walk in freedom. He who the Son of Man has set free is free indeed. So let's talk a little bit about offense. There's not a one of us that doesn't go through offense. Every week of our life, if you allow yourself to enter into healthy relationships, you're going to face offense because sometimes people say things that will cut you. Sometimes people will do things. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at a, uh, a meeting and there was a sister there that I really didn't know that well. In fact, she's not even hardly giving me the time of day the whole time that I've been uh, uh, connected to, the, to this, this local ecclesia that's here in Houston. But I had said something that I had done something that was very innocent. And she, in front of everybody, just tore into me, said I was rude and you should never do something like that. And it shocked me. And it actually really upset me because it was very demeaning. But you know what? I made the choice to forgive this sister and never brought it up, never retaliated with words. Why? Because when offenses come, you have to learn to immediately forgive them and release them. Because every minute that goes by, every hour, and especially every day that goes by that you allow an offense to seethe in your spirit, it starts laying the roots for bitterness. An offense is a violation of what we would consider to be right and natural. Jesus said that a sign of the last days would be that many would be offended, betray, and hate one another. That's Matthew 24 and 10. The word offense comes from the Greek word skandaleon. Skandaleon literally means debate. Debate. I remember a book I read about 10 years ago by John Bevere called The Bait of Satan, which is to cause people to become offended. Satan wants you to take offenses personal. When people come against you, when people harm you, when people take advantage of you, when people say things that cut you, the enemy wants you to take offense. But you got to refuse to take the bait and keep your heart with all diligence. I'll be honest with you on this journey I've been on. When I stepped away from the stream of ministry that I've been connected to for 30 years, I had many that came against me. And spoke some very, very harsh words against me. I even had some deep pain and deep loss in my own life concerning my family and the ones I love. And everything within me wanted to set the record straight and justify and defend myself. But time and time again on this journey that I've taken, I've been reminded by the Holy Spirit to just keep my peace. The Bible there's an old song that says, 
If I hold my peace, let the Lord fight my battle. If I hold my peace, let the Lord fight my battle. Victory, victory shall be mine. We can have victory. In the, in the Old Testament, this word scandalion was used for in times when people wanted to trap an animal. That's what the literal root word would describe when someone would try to set a trap for an animal. A pit will be covered with branches and a piece of flesh, the bait, scandalion, will be placed on the pit to lure that tra- animal into the trap. Offenses lures us into a trap of unforgiveness and bondage. We think we're trapping the person who hurt us. In reality, we are the ones that become ensnared. Now, let me say again, forgiveness is not reconciliation. There have been many thousands of people I've forgiven over the past two years that God has not led me to be reconciled back to them as far as ministry is concerned. I may never speak in some of these people's churches again. I may never attend a conference that this particular group of people puts on. But you know what? In my heart, I've forgiven them and I've released them. But there is no leading of the Spirit in my life to become reconciled back to them. And again, I want to say there are people in your life that have done harmful, damaging things to you. That God pulled you away from them. That in your process of forgiving them, don't feel like you have to re-empower them to wound you all over again. Or pull you back into snares and back into traps again. Because that is not the definition of forgiveness. Proverbs 18 and 19 was one of your homeworks to write out. And it talks about the progression of offense. The NLT version says, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Why? Walls go up. When you offend somebody, you know, I, I've offended people with my words. And I've had to work over time to get those walls that are up to drop. And the only thing that causes walls that have been formed when someone got offended is when you speak words of humility. And you, you admit that you hurt them, and you ask them, please forgive me. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But again, forgiveness is really a one-way street. Because there are people that you will go to, and you will either ask them to forgive you, or you will choose to forgive them. But you cannot be responsible for the response. Some people, when you ask them to forgive you, they may say no. Well, you've done your part. You can move on and be right in God's eyes. Or there are other people that you can choose to forgive them. And they'll hurt you worse by mocking you and saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't harm you when they very well know they did. Don't let that become your problem. Once you've forgiven them, your part is finished. The scripture goes on to say, Arguments separate friends like a gate. I am so sorry. I can't read my handwriting. (laughs) Like a gate locked with bars. That's what it is. (laughs) My handwriting was so terrible. I couldn't even read my own handwriting. But arguments separate people like a gate locked with bars. God wants to take all these walls and bars down. And bring a healing. See, offense is the bait the enemy uses to lure us into bondage. When we become offended, we become unyielding. Think about a city surrounded by gates. The purpose of the gates is to protect the city. We use this same thinking to protect ourselves. And we place walls around our hearts. People may hurt us once. But we will not allow them to do it again. For what works for a city of stone does not necessarily work in the same way for flesh and blood. The problem is 
that walls may keep out the bad stuff, but they also keep out the good. Think about that. Amen. It's somebody that's testing, texting me about the webinar. <sighs> I'm not going to do it because it's, it's giving me a problem there. <clears throat> See, the key is this. You know, the spirit of Jezebel loves to latch itself to people who have suffered. Suffered in relationships, suffered from authority, whether it's a pastor, a parent, a husband. Uh, some type of uh, authority. And the spirit of Jezebel loves to try to latch itself to that person. And, and many times it portrays itself. I, I've talked, especially with women who got abused by an authority. I know as many women who have an anointing of God for prophecy. That they were in a setting in a church that was a very chauvinistic, male-dominant environment. That in their Erroneous thinking. They didn't understand that both sons and daughters prophesy. So they would wound these prophets with rejecting words, with words to put them down. And I've seen, and it's not just women, but it's also, um, uh, God bless you, Brother James Sharp. I'm glad you're on, brother. It's also um, can it attack men. And I, as a matter of fact, that's one thing that prophets have to be very careful about because the very nature of a prophet is to be rejected. That's why Jeremiah said, don't look at the hardness of their faces because people will wound you for speaking forth the word from God. And you have got to be secure in your relationship with God and not allow these wounds to uh, become personal to you and to become an offense in your life. And I've seen people that just got to a point where they just became a lone ranger. They would not allow any authority to speak into their life because at one time they were wounded by an authority. The Bible calls them shooting stars or clouds without wind and rain. clouds with wind but without rain. What it means is you've got this ministry that you, it seems you're anointed, it seems you're powerful, but there's no fruit because there's principles to authority. The Bible clearly, Jesus said that, it taught the parable with the centurion and said that if you want authority, you've got to be under authority. You know, if I did not have covering in my life, if I did not have elders that I was submitted to and honored, even right now, there's no way I as an apostle could provide covering to others. It's just, it's, it's you can't defeat these principles. And so I've seen people just, they bounce from place to place and they never again. And really what it is, is when you get deeply wounded, many times the reaction that people have, is they, they try to control all relationships around them. That's why someone who's become wounded and a spirit of Jezebel comes upon them, they are very controlling and manipulating. Well, it's not so much that they're wicked. It's just that is their way of putting up these bars and putting up these gates in their life so no one else can hurt them again. So we use this same thinking of putting up walls and gates to try to protect ourselves and put walls around our heart. And people may hurt us once and we make our minds up, they will never hurt us again. But what, but what works for a city of stone does not necessarily work in the same way for flesh and blood. The problem is walls may keep out the bad stuff, but it also keeps out the good. When you cut off all relationships in your life, then you, you cut off your ability to love and be loved. In fact, the only way you can hurt is by loving. And there's a joy in keeping ourselves at a place where we open our hearts and trust God. Amen. God will, God will protect us. God will keep us. But you can't just become an island and cut everyone off because you were hurt. You see, with walls, we not only protect ourselves from pain and rejection, but we keep ourselves from experiencing love 
and life-giving relationships. We think it's up to us to protect our hearts, but the truth is God never meant for this to be our responsibility. It is his to protect our hearts. Let me pause here and say it to give you some balance. That doesn't mean you go and subject yourself to abusive leadership and abusive ministries. That's not what God is saying. What he's saying is be sure to leave your heart open to relationships in life and leave the protecting of your heart to God. How and why we become offended may vary, but one thing does not change. We will face offenses in this world. Jesus said it. You're going to have offenses. It must happen. Matter of fact, it is offenses that God uses to purify us. Amen. When offenses come, we've got to decide, are we going to take the bait from the adversary and become offended? Are we going to choose to keep our hearts with all diligence? And forgive. Because unforgiveness is a trap. On your page, we have a chart of five common snares the enemy uses to lure us in unforgiveness. Now notice that for each of the wrongdoings, Jesus also suffered the same offense. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He allowed himself to be tempted in every way that we are today. Because he wanted you to know that no matter what you face, he's been there and he overcame. Let's look at it. When we are betrayed, a best friend who lied on you, a spouse who didn't stay forever, a sibling who chose a different path. Remember, Jesus was betrayed. He was betrayed by Judas, a trusted friend. And one of his hand-chosen 12 disciples. When we're falsely accused, misunderstood, we become the subject of gossip and slander. Remember, Jesus was falsely accused in several counts, courts, excuse me. When we're rejected by a spouse, by a friend, by a trusted authority, or even by the local church. Remember, Jesus was rejected. He suffered rejection by Peter, one of his apostles and closest companions. When we're abused emotionally, physically, verbally, and even sexually. Remember, Jesus was abused, beaten, cursed, crucified on a cross. And remember, he was crucified naked, suffering the humiliation of open nakedness on a cross. When we're humiliated by an embarrassing moment that just won't go away, or shame and disgrace that tries to come upon us, remember he was crucified and again humiliated in a public setting. Now, let me pause here and say, many of these things I myself, especially in the past three or four years since I've been pursuing to teach and to tr train and to to, to follow after the uh, apostolic prophetic, especially in teaching and training on the fivefold ministry giftings, the importance of them, and uh, helping believers to step into their ministry and, and, and into their callings. Uh, many of these things I faced on this page. And I can tell you right now, the only way I've survived is every single day I have to humble myself before God in prayer and give these hurts to him. It's not a one-time thing. Forgiveness is not a one-time thing you do, and that's it. It's something that every day you have to exercise every day, every day. To get a better understanding of why Jesus had to suffer the way he did, let's read Hebrews 12, excuse me, Hebrews 2, verse 17 through 18. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he became before God as high priest to get rid of people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain and all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. 
It was important for Jesus to experience all of these offenses in a human body so he could understand every struggle that we would encounter as human beings. Now, when we come to him with our hurts, he can honestly reply, I understand. I went through that too. Jesus did this for us. Now, he wants to share a secret that only he is qualified to teach. Now, in your homework, you should have written out 1 Peter 4 and 1. And I wrote out, so then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. Now, I, sound, I know this sounds incredibly negative, but child of God, let me tell you something. If you think you're going to obey God and fulfill your prophetic destiny and fulfill what God has called you to do without any pain, then you're only trying to fool yourself because it comes with a the territory. Therefore, it's important that you become acquainted with the necessity of the discipline of forgiveness and use it time and time again to be sure that your heart stays free and clear. So stop and think about it. God's or having a godly response to offense is what helps keep our hearts pure. Now, I know all of us have bad days and bad times where we respond in the flesh. But even when we do that, it's important we immediately repent before God and ask God, Lord, help me to have godly responses when people betray me and reject me and hurt me and, 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 and do all these different things. The secret is not that Jesus was offended, but rather how he responded to the offense. At his death, Jesus asked, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He asked forgiveness for the very ones who cursed him. The very ones who nailed his hands and feet to the cross. In reality, they knew exactly what they were doing. Killing a man that they hated and making sure he felt every ounce of their malice. Jesus knew they were blinded by hate. But he chose to see things differently. And we can too. Offenses will come. So we must arm ourselves with the same thinking of Jesus. Our primary prayer for people should be that the Lord will allow us to see them through his eyes. If we change our viewpoint from the reality of this world to the reality of God, we will find ourselves loving people the way that Jesus loved. And regardless of what they do or don't do to us, how do we keep our hearts pure and unoffended? Consider these three simple statements. Statement one, we need forgiveness too. I know I need it every day. <laughs> we'll never have to forgive others more than what God has forgiven us of. In your homework, you should have written out Romans 3 and 23. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Also, you should have written out Matthew 10 and 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely received, freely give. The second point is focus on the real enemy. People are not our enemy. It's the enemy. It's the devil. Jesus made a choice to see people with the hammer and nails as victims. If it's true that hurting people hurt people, then the guilty have their own story as well. Our goal should be to love people and to hate the devil. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The third point here is, receive the love of God. This will give you the capacity to love people. 
And again, that's agape love that's shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit, according to Romans. If you continually struggle to love people, it may be because you've not fully received the love of God. This is one revelation of grace, understanding and receiving the love of God. In your homework, you should have written out 1 John 4 and 10. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Receiving the love of God first is the only way that you can truly give it to others. Forgiveness in action. The Bible steps for walking out forgiveness are countercultural, which means that it's the opposite of mainstream society, and counterintuitive, which means you don't normally expect this from people in life. But if you follow forgiveness, they will change your life. Our way of thinking and God's way of thinking are not the same. You can read 1 Corinthians 25 to 28 to gain the proper perspective of obedience to God's ways of doing things. We should not be conformed to what the world says, but transformed that our minds can become renewed. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, and not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Amen. So pray for people that have offended you. Don't just pray for them, but pray God to bless them. That's tough. But that's the way to freedom. Society tells us return evil for evil. Or at the very least, isolate the people who hurt us so they can never do it again. But Jesus said in order to have results, we should respond differently. Matthew 5, 43-44 tells us, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for them who persecute you. Wow. So God's way is to bless people who have offended you. For some of us, it is all we can do not to talk negatively about the people who wronged us. But Jesus is asking us to go a step further. He's asking us to bless them. The word bless means to speak well of them, to speak honorable of them. Again, this is not something that is demonstrated by today's culture. How would your life change if you chose to believe the best in everyone, even your enemies? Let's listen to what the Bible says in Luke 6, 27-28. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. In your homework, you should have written out Romans 12 and 14. I wrote out, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Wow. That's a tough scripture. But it's the way to freedom. Do good to people who have offended you. See, this requires a major change in our thinking. It's not that we are repaying good for evil. It's that we made the decision to only do good to others. So whether someone is serving or attacking us, our response should be to do what the word says to do. God sees every detail of our life, and he'll take every 
He'll take care of every detail that we choose to trust him to handle. And the things that we take in our own hands, he lets, he, he lets us do it. And every time I've taken something in my own hands, my brothers, sisters, I've made a mess of it. So we have to ask ourselves, are there people in my life that I've not released to the Lord? Am I trying to get justice from them? Am I trying to make them pay? I challenge you. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I know that those listening to this class today have suffered many things. They've suffered injustices and hurts and wounds and pain, trying to fulfill the gifting that's in their life. God, I'm asking you to help us, empower us to bless those that curse us, to do good to those that do evil against us, and to pray for those that would do despiteful things against us. Strengthen us and empower us, O oh God, to, to do these things, I pray in Jesus' name. Well, there's someone else that we've got to choose to forgive, and that's ourselves. I, I started off this, this teaching with talking about the book that I wrote about eight years ago called The Freedom of Forgiveness. And in this book, I have three main chapters. The first is shame, how God wants to release you from the grudge you have against yourself. Then I talk about um, guilt. And then I talk about rebellion. And, and in this book, I talk about how shame is the grudge that we hold against ourselves. Bitterness is the grudge we hold against others, and rebellion is the grudge we hold against God. Let's talk about the grudge we hold against ourselves. Getting past your past may be the biggest obstacle you face. Every time you seem to be making progress in your life, that old movie reel of the sinful things you've done begins to play in your mind. Peace and freedom slip quietly away as your past rises up and tries to become your present reality. You think forgiveness is for others and not for you because you've done too many horrible things and it's just simply too late to make a difference. It's time to let freedom ring. I'd like everybody to make sure you're on page 77 because there's a de declaration from Romans 12 17 through 21, and I want us all to read it out loud. So if you've if you got page 77, we're going to declare this right now in Jesus' name. Are you ready? Let's read it. I do not repay evil for evil. I am careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on me, I will live at peace with everyone. I will not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if my enemy is hungry, I will feed him. If he's thirsty, I will give him something to drink. I will not be overcome by evil, but I will overcome evil with good. That's a great declaration. Hallelujah. Can you feel the power of those words? Let's go to page 78 because there's a prayer of forgiveness there. And this is a sample prayer of forgiveness that you can use to release anyone who's offended you. And you can insert the names of or names of those you feel you need to forgive and say these words aloud. I encourage you, copy this prayer of forgiveness. So when someone has forgive, harmed you, that you'll be able to pray this prayer. Are you ready? Let's pray it together out loud. Lord, I have not loved, but resented certain people. And I have unforgiveness in my heart. Forgive me for my sin of offense. 
I ask you, Lord, to give me to pow- the power to release and forgive those who have hurt me. I do now forgive them and ask you to forgive me also. Give me the strength to pray for them, bless them, and want the best for them. Thank you for breaking these chains off my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Wow, what a powerful prayer. So once again, you can insert the person's name. Like if someone who hurt you, his name was Doug. You can say, Lord, I've not loved, but have resented certain. I resented Doug. And I have unforgiveness in my heart towards Doug. Forgive me for my sin of offense. I ask you, Lord, give me the power to release and forgive Doug who hurt me. I do now forgive Doug. And I ask you to forgive me also. Give me the strength to pray for Doug and to bless Doug. I want the best for Doug's life. Thank you, God, for breaking these chains off my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You see, that's the step beyond forgiving someone is when you can pray blessings on them. When you can say their name and say, God, bless Jim's life. God, bless Sarah's life. And it may be a group of people. You may have to pray this prayer to bless an entire organization. I've done it. God, I pray your blessings on XYZ organization. Bless their leaders. Bless their officials. Bless their pastors. Bless their works. So you can also have true forgiveness. Now you may be surprised to know these feelings are actually common to many believers. It feels godly to pay for our past over and over and over. But that's tree of life mindsets. Excuse me, tree of knowledge of good and evil. The enemy is quick to remind us of painful memories that we're powerless to change. Why does he do this? Because it keeps us stuck in the past, unable to move forward to the future the Lord has planned. These thoughts come solely from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you find yourself trying to do something to make yourself pay for some mistake you made in the past? Brothers and sisters, be free. I decree freedom upon you that you can release this into the hands of God and leave it once and for all under the blood he shed because his price he paid is a finished work. Amen? So ask yourself, am I constantly reminding myself of past failures? Does sin of my past continue to bother me, even though I ask God to forgive me? And if there's yes to any of those questions, then you can be sure of one thing. It's the enemy at work trying to drag you down and prevent you from laying hold of the prophetic destiny God has for you. So I challenge you in the name of Jesus to cast off the lies of hell. Refuse to be bound by these memories of guilt and shame. Receive freedom and receive forgiveness and quit trying to pay for your past. And lift your eyes to the tree of life and receive life, my brothers and sisters. Let's talk about the past and the present. When our past comes rising up, there are three ways we usually respond. We try to bury it. Have you heard the phrase, you got to bury the past? Well, the fact is you can't. It will find its way to the surface at some point. We hear that time heals all wounds. But time cannot. Simple time passing doesn't heal wounds. It's when you do the proper things of God's word to forgive, to release, to bless others, then the Holy Spirit can work to bring healing. Concealing the past never works. Proverbs 28 and 13 says, Whosoever conceals his sins does not prosper, 
but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And according to James 5, confessing our sins and praying for another actually helps to bring healing and wholeness. Let me pause here and say, this doesn't mean you go and broadcast your sins to everyone you meet. You find accountability partners, people that you trust and they're confidential. And you become accountable. And once you've shared a fault or failure and they've prayed with you, move on. Don't keep bringing it up time and time again. You're forgiven. Amen. The second thing is, when we fail, we beat ourselves up. Some of us live in the land of regret. We, de- we dwell on the if-only scenarios from our past. If I'd never done that, if I'd never made that mistake, if I had never... And that somehow tries to convince you that you're damaged goods and somehow you're not where you should be in God because of some mistake you made. My friend, the grace of God has the power to put us wherever God wants us to be, to place us securely in that place. And understand, even right now, with all of our history, our failures, our shortcomings, the turns in a row we missed, the mistakes we made. If we humble ourselves before God and we're making sure there's no unrepented or hidden sin in our life, that not only have we, we brought it out before God and confessed it and become accountable for it, but we've forsaken it. We're no longer doing it. Then, my friend, you are right where God wants you to be. Not a step behind. We cannot change the past, and the enemy uses our past to torment us. King David knew this type of grief. He committed adultery with his own soldier's wife, and then had him killed when she became pregnant with his child. When Nathan confronted David, he repented and cried out to God. And we can read his grief in Psalms 38, verse 4 through 8. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. See, we see that unforgiveness, even towards ourselves, can cause physical as well as emotional pain. The truth is, if you don't let your past die, then your past will not let you live. The third thing we do is we blame others. This tactic has been used since the times of Adam and Eve. When God asked Adam why he disobeyed, what did Adam do? He blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. We must take responsibility for our actions. Repent and just move forward. Amen? Since these are innocent responses to dealing with our path, I'm sorry, Since these are incorrect responses for dealing with our past, how are we supposed to face it? We look to the word of God. He has the right view of our past. And we must believe the view God has of us. God says when we ask Jesus into our hearts, our old life vanishes. And we become a new person. Not just fixed up and brushed up and painted up. Brand new. The Bible says old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You see, you may know this in your head, but it's got to be the reality that we live. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Second Corinthians 5 and 17, another translation says, For if a man belongs to Christ, he's a new person. The old life is gone. New life has begun. Even though the Apostle Paul had a past 
of persecuting and killing Christians. He understood this truth and it reshaped his thinking. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 13-15, he said, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So we got to get past the past. I like that. Get past the past. To let our past die, we must change our way of thinking. The old way of thinking doesn't line up to God's word, so it doesn't produce life. We can adjust our way of thinking by studying what God says is true. First of all, stop trying to earn forgiveness. I've told you many times before, for many years in my ministry, I did a lot of improper fasting. What makes fasting improper when you fast for the wrong motive? And many times I fasted. Because I was punishing myself for making the mistake. The only reason why we fast is to deny our flesh so we can draw closer to God. That's it. Amen. Amen. We can adjust our thinking by studying what the Word of God says is true. Most people don't understand the gospel. They think that they can be good more days than days that are bad, then they get to go to heaven. But that's not true. The price has been paid. Forgiveness is simply received. It's not earned. If we think we have to earn forgiveness from God, then guess what happens? We'll make others earn forgiveness from us. So that's the the religious mindset of the Pharisee. That's actually the spirit of Jezebel. Because if in our mind we think that we had to do something incredibly terrible, incredibly difficult to earn. That's why people who think that holiness is in what people call standards. Or that holiness is in what you dress and the length that you grow your hair as a woman or the things that you don't do. And you got your list of all these things you do that make you holy and all these things that you don't do that keep you holy. Then in your mind, you've climbed the mountain of success in religious order. People admire you. They come to you they look at how you dress and how you look and they say, Oh, I, I admire and, So much the standard that you keep. And there's so much self-pride in that. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil told Eve that the tree was powerful to make one wise and to be desired of. When we live in God's grace, that just means we understand that holiness is imputed by justification to begin with. We are justified. By the blood of Christ. When we repent of our sins. And we're baptized in his name. And those sins are washed away. We are justified. A very simple explanation of justification. Is just as if it never happened. At that moment. God imputes his holiness to us. At that very moment. We are as holy as we will ever be. In our entire life. But that doesn't remove. The understanding of sanctification. Sanctification is allowing the character and the nature of God to be developed in us through obedience to his word, through denying our flesh and prayer and fasting and things just nature and seeking the face of God. And as we begin to read his word, we understand there are some things we should not do. 
There are some things that we must be cautious about in our life and lifestyles to live. But it's not a way for us to earn the badge of holiness. So stop trying to earn forgiveness. Now, well-meaning friends may say that you need to just forgive yourself or just give yourself a break. The truth is we can't forgive ourselves. Forgiveness is not ours to give. It is God's to give. Let's look at what the Word of God says about this in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Amen? Amen. So receive God's forgiveness by faith. When you simply repent and say, God, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn from that. I'm not going to do that again. I'm setting my heart to follow you. You're forgiven. His blood washes you. I understand that there's that time of consecration in our life where we show the separation from this world and we show our commitment to follow Christ in being baptized in water by immersion in the name of Jesus. That's a one-time thing. I remember... The first time I went to India, I went to a pastor's house, and this pastor had had a missionary come through that was was not did not have any formal training by a seminary or a Bible college, and he just went over there. So his biblical uh, foundation was very very shallow. And he had taught these precious Indian people that every time they sinned, they had to get baptized again. So in every person's house, they had a little blue wading pool. And every morning they would get up, they would make their tea, they'd fill the pool with water, and the husband would baptize the wife, and the wife would baptize the husband. <laughs> and this was error, and I had to teach them and tell them, no, 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 no. You get baptized one time in obedience to the word and showing your commitment to God and separation from the world. From that point forward, all you do is ask God to forgive you. And the moment you ask him, his blood again is applied to you, fresh and new. So, receive God's forgiveness by faith. It frees your heart and allows you to forgive others. Defeat every lie that comes against you with truth. That's how you defeat lies. Amen. Amen. It would be great if once we had received forgiveness, we never thought about our past again. The truth is, the enemy will continually bring up your past every day. He will wait for weak moments in your life and then whisper your failures to you. We have to resist him every day because he is the father of lies. That's his job description. John 8 and 44 says, When he lies, he speaks his native language. He is the accuser of the brethren. But we defeat him by knowing and speaking truth. So in closing, in your homework, you should have written out 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. And I wrote out, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. So allow God to turn things around for good. We can continue to focus on the past, or we can focus on the beauty of the future. I can tell you in my trial of the losses that I have suffered in the past three years, uh, many losses, many strippings. Many times when I meet brand new people, I would have a tendency to speak from my past, from my hurts. And I've been training myself over the past four months with the help of the wonderful pastor here in Houston, Texas, Wendell Hutchins, to not speak from my brokenness, to not speak from the failures of the past, 
to speak in the promise of the future, to speak of what God is getting ready to do. And so when I talk to people, I tell them, God sent me to Houston to raise an international training prophetic center. And there will come a day that there will be a international center that people will come from all over the world to receive training and equipping in their lives. Well, that's my reminder to not teach more than an hour and a half because I knew tonight was going to be a long, drawn-out teaching. So I'm going to try to close up real quick here. Whatever has happened, how tragic, God can turn it around for good. And that's what the Bible says in Romans 8 and 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So whatever purpose God has planned for your life, man and woman of God, everything that has happened in your life can be worked for the good. There are no mistakes. There are no surprises for God. He can even take the worst decisions you ever made and the worst mistakes and turn them for good, for the purpose you're called. But remember this, child of God, your mistakes do not defeat your prophetic destiny. Just get up, move on, and focus on the future that God has for you. You can use your past to minister hope to others. Take the comfort that you receive from God and comfort others. Consider the story of Joseph. He was betrayed, falsely accused, rejected, and abused. But God made him prosper and used him to save his family and the nation of Egypt. And look at his bold statement after he's delivered from the prison and he's restored into his rightful prophetic destiny. Genesis 5 and 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. God never said that forgiveness will be easy. In fact, following the instruction in his word takes courage and strength. But God's instructions work. They will lead us into paths of righteousness. We can live again free from the ghosts of our past. No more guilt, no more hiding, no more shame. Simply free. It takes faith to believe that these words are true, but if you do, they will change your life forever. Amen. Amen. Believe that you have been made new and clean, that he can and will make you whole again. But be warned, life as you know it will never be the same. As you begin to see yourself the way God sees you, you will begin to see others differently. You'll find yourself in open hands, releasing offenses and receiving life abundant. And then, my friend, then and only then will you truly be living in the tree of life. Well, that concludes this week's teaching. God bless you. I pray it was a benefit to you. I, I Again, I apologize. I have no clue. Something technical must have happened because there's so many technicalities with doing this webinar. I have to... to, to, to run it through the um, Google Hangouts, through YouTube, and it's just very technical in its setup. So something must have been off, but I'm so glad that I was able to come on and connect with you. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us. I pray that this was a blessing to you. Do me a favor. If, if, if this teaching is blessing you while I'm teaching, uh, some of them are doing it. They, they type in the uh, chat box different things like, JJ is saying, uh, uh, it's not JJ, I think that's, I think that's uh, Chris, uh, Sherry, excuse me. Sherry is saying amen. Um, someone said, Holly, a good stuff apostle. I'm sorry, a lot of your names don't show up, so I don't know who you are when you say these things. Amen. It might have been James Sharp. I think that's who it is. Amen. So thank you so much. And Andrea, amen. God bless you. Amen. And 
I, I pray this was a blessing to you and a strength to you. And uh, if you want to catch the first part of this lesson, uh, it takes two hours for the um, it takes two hours for the replay to uh, uh, get all set up and, and uploaded. So after two hours tonight, if you want to watch the first part of this lesson, you can, or you can wait and watch it in the morning. But God bless you. I love you. This is such a joy to be with you every Tuesday night. We're looking forward to next week and our teaching on next week. And oh, yes, please, please take time to write in the back of your book after this teaching. Take a few minutes and just quiet yourself with the Lord and write what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you personally concerning this week's lesson on forgiveness. Next week, we're going to talk about the power of words. I love you. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I believe in you. I love each one of you. I can't wait to see you again. And I pray that you walk in the freedom of forgiveness. It's Apostle Orcovio. Good night. Um, yes, you can go back and watch previous webinars. If you want to watch previous webinars, if you will email me or email my assistant, Jesse Co., um, I can send you all of the links that you can watch all the webinars. Um, I, I had had the setting on it that the webinars were pulled down after seven days, but I changed that. And uh, now... All of the webinars, you can go back at any time and watch them and rewatch them. And uh, there, uh, I know you might have deleted the links off your email. So um, if you send me a specific email request asking for the previous links, I'll send you all of the links that are there. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and post it right now in the chat. And I'll send it to all of you so you can just... Um, Copy and paste them. Uh, let's see. I gotta find that. Give me a second to find those links. Here they are. So these are all the links for the previous five. So if you'll just go ahead and copy and paste all of these replay links it's on your screen right now that is how you access sessions one through five and then tonight's link after two hours will be automatically sent to you by email god bless you we love you have a great day great evening